Right, uh, hello everybody and welcome back to another GRPJ, a good reason to play JRPG. Today, a uh, Super Mario RPG, one of the, the ones that is uh, Super Mario, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Let's get right into the things. Spoilers! Turn back now! Turn back very soon. Spoilers for the fucking game. So let's talk about the intro a little bit. The intro, yeah, I noticed immediately the, the cartoony style was very nice in the cutscene at the beginning. Um, there was a lot of stuff in the cutscene that was kind of felt kind of spoilery. Uh, so I decided to skip uh, after I saw Geno or Gino or however you say that guy's name. Because I already knew about Gino from my friend Nate going ape shit about Gino's character costume being in Super Smash Bros. So I knew he was a character, but felt like it was a bit of a spoiler to show him immediately. So I skipped that. At the end of the game, I actually went back and, and looked, and it turns out it was quite it was spoiling quite a lot of places and things that happened. Uh, but uh, you know, whatever. Instantly, I recognized that. Uh, a lot of the music from this game is used by YouTubers in YouTube videos because I recognize basically most of the, the themes and, you know, uh, recognize them. One thing I like about the, the, the way it starts is that after the cutscene and stuff, uh, you press start and then you're instantly in Bowser's Castle and you're moving around and you can figure out, you know, the, 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 the controls, the things, all that stuff. It's pretty great. Like, they get straight to the action. The, the whole cutscene in Bowser's Castle is pretty cool. And then the giant fucking sword comes down. Whew. Pretty, pretty nice. Uh, so, uh, the intro's great, really. I've not, not really got much to say about the intro itself. Just sort of that, um, you know, it was good. Alright, let's talk about the aesthetic now. The aesthetic um, of the game in general is really nice. Uh, I'll read off a bunch of my notes of... Uh, the things that I mentioned, that I noticed, instantly love the sound effects. Uh, the jumping, the the hitting things, the everything. Everything sounds good. The sound effect designers are great. Good, top-notch job. Especially, you know, especially the jumping. The jumping, um, I find my. I really just want that sound bite. I want to find that thing and have it as like a I don't know a phone update jingle. Because I just love the way it boing, boing, you know, it's pretty great, pretty, it's pretty juicy, it's a juicy little sound effect, and it's perfect for jumping, which is something you do a lot. Also bouncing on the bed, very bouncy, very lovely sound, it's great sound. Now, uh, the, uh, the way everything looks, it looks like it's pre-rendered, like in 3D, a simple 3D model and stuff, and it's pre-rendered and put down. Could be true, or it could just be very talented artists drawing them in 3D. Uh, as if they were 3D, I don't know, but it, it looks very nice. It's very very uh, unique I haven't seen that style really anywhere else Where it's it's almost like everything's made of like plasticine It's like that that game Can't remember the name of it. It's like a plasticine click point and click where everything's plasticine or clay and It looks really cool, but it's all digitized like frames I don't know why they wrote this in a, the aesthetic thing, but you can stand on people's heads, which is something I do like. Uh, especially since you're a guy who jumps really high. Just, you know, you just stand on their heads and that's it. They're, they're, they're being stood on. So that's, that's pretty great. Pretty, pretty top-notch head-standing action going on there. Now the music. The music is great. Um, the victory music is very fun. Uh, I was dancing to it as soon as I killed the guy. It was, it was one of those sort of like, yeah, you know, very easy to, to, to dance to. Very, very easy to, to dance to that sort of uh, jingly jangly stuff. All the songs are very bouncy, very uh, lively, very cool. The spooky ones are pretty spooky, but they're still childish and friendly and fun and fucking great. So, good job, uh, music man. Uh, one music song I didn't like was the the tadpole area thing. For some reason it was just really grating, like like it's screechy, eh! you know. Um, not much, not much fun of that. One thing I like uh, is that it seems like not only does 
you know, the world look very lively and cool, but all the characters in it, uh, they're all very personality y They have their own little things they're doing, their interesting dialogue. Like, I, I, I enjoyed talking to everyone. I think that's more in a story and char characters category, but I'm putting it here, I guess. But it's just nice to know that they've... They put a lot of uh, thought into every little NPC that, you know, is just sort of doing something. There's this one that I noted here, where there's a mopey teen toad, and he's playing his Game Boy, and if you talk to him too many times, he says, Oh, you made me die! You, I, I'm, an, I'm angry! Which is pretty funny, and it's a very, it's a very pleasant experience just being in like a town or walking around. Which is nice. Just feels very good aesthetically. Good. It's fucking adorable. The best. It's the best ever I've ever, ever played. Now here's a cool thing. The, there's a certain persistence in certain things, and you know the the, the detail is very detailed. Uh, for example, there's these pogo shy guys, and they're uh, you know they're pogoing all over town, and they're causing trouble and stuff. And you can hear them bouncing, boing boing. And then there's this one guy who's uh, pogoing off the side of a building. And if you go inside the building while he's still doing that, you can hear um, the the sound of him pogoing at the same rhythm that he was outside, like brr brr, like and it's like it's just right, it's just just, just, just great. Just really great. I like it. I like I like how you can hear him. Uh, there was this little kid. Uh, it was really cute. Really, this should be in story and characters. I don't know why I wrote this as aesthetic. Maybe it's just like it's just reiterating that everything is really cool and cute, and I love it, and all the t attention to detail. But there's this kid who was playing with Super Mario toys, and they went to the effort of animating him actually playing with them and running around and doing dialogue and you know unique little throw-in animations with the the dolls and. It's it's just really cute and I love it. I love the attention to detail in this game. It's really great. Forest theme music, pretty great, pretty spectacular. Really, the notes about aesthetic are just when I've like become overwhelmed with how good something is, and then I'm like, wow, ah, cool, and then I write it down. But I didn't really write it down anything about why it's good. I'm just like really happy that I'm seeing a really cool thing or I like a music. So this part of the video is kind of stupid, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> oh yeah, the the level design. Some of the levels just look like Mario levels. Like you go down a pipe, there's warp pipes in this. But there are some levels that are just like... The, the, well the thing is isometric, so it's an isometric grid and you can jump and stuff. But then there's also places where it's like the floor is very thin, very thin and narrow, so you can only go like up left or down right. Or whatever and they built like a Mario level in that sort of style because it's like a linear thing and you've got enemies in your way you got to jump over them or you know attack them there's a place in the mole area where you can jump all over the place you can go up all the top of the mountain I mean the map isn't like doesn't go on forever the map just stops that's how the, the game is they they have the levels and then there's just the edge of the level edge of the the scene, the area, the map, the location, and it goes to the next one. So you don't see like vast plains or anything, but the mountain area, there's no reason to go up to the top of the mountain, as far as I know, but you can, you if you just, you know, decide to go up there and jump and get the perfect jumps, you can get right to the top, and it's pretty great. The uh, reactions of the characters it's another animation thing. The animation is like great. The body language, the, the the character design, the way they animate the characters gives them so much personality. There's this one thing that I've posted a link to a picture of Bowser going, "Oh shit, it's Mario!" I might put that on the screen. Wink. I didn't put it on the screen, did I? Oh well. When a party member falls asleep, their health bar also falls asleep, which is kind of cute. Something I noticed. What other cute things did I notice? I already mentioned that I love the way they animate the things with the, the characters, but there's certain moments where the characters act out, like certain scenes, instead of having dialogue do it, uh, which is a, a, a really a intensive, like, animation-intensive way of explaining something 
for the purposes of it being interesting, rather than just saying, yes, we did this and this is what happened, or maybe just cutting to black and fading in and somebody says, oh, I see. Like, uh, that's just, it's it's going that extra mile. This, this game goes the extra mile to make it really great. They don't cut any corners, it's, and it's just lovely. Like the Mario and Bowser miming when the big sword came down is amazing. And the fact that they know to do it without conferring is hilarious, and, you know, the way the Mario just transforms into other objects to, to mime things properly, it's, uh, it's really top of the line. You know when in RPGs there's one character that you're moving around, and then sometimes when other party members in your party have to talk, they sort of come out of your... You, you know, where wherever you're standing and stand next to you. Like they they were inside your pocket or something. In this game that happens as well. You're walking around as Mario all the time and when another party member has to talk, they just come out of you. Then they're there and then they go back in. And then there's this one bit where your party members come out to talk and then they begin to go back into you as if the cutscene is over. But then the guy talking to uh, you were talking to says, wait, and he stops you and then you know, everybody bumps into each other, like like they were going into you and then suddenly Mario is no longer incorporeal and they smash into him and fall on the floor. And then he tells them some more stuff. Then they're like, okay, finally, the cutscene is over. And then they go back in, they begin to walk back into Mario. Um, but before they go all the way, they pause, look at the guy again to make sure he's absolutely done. Like, make sh absolutely sure he's done. So they, they don't crash into him again. And then they go back into him and they, then you're playing again. It's just, it's so, that was quite meta and humanizing for that part. Like every other time that the, the, the animation does, it happens where the character walks into, um, into and out of Mario. You know that that is just a, a set animation. And this time they just paused it, stopped it, like, ah, oh. even the characters didn't know what was going on. They weren't prepared for that. It's just so, it's, it's, it's very humanizing is the word I used. It makes them feel like they're actually characters in a world where you can just walk into somebody at the end of a conversation. It was just really funny. Oh, and there was this other point that was pretty cool. Uh, in Booster's Castle, not Bowser's, Booster's, um, there's a part where you're standing behind a curtain, you're hiding behind a curtain, and there's a dialogue cutscene thing going on, but you can still move around while you're doing it. And the point is that you they eventually go and look in the curtains, and you have to run behind the curtain that isn't being opened. Um, and I, I just really like... I like the idea of being able to move around during a cutscene, because you'd never really be able to do that before. Star Hill, very beautiful place. Very nice to look at, very peaceful, very beautiful. It's just another rung on the, the ladder of, of how good the art direction is in this game. Oh yeah, that's one thing. The unique designs are very interesting. Like, uh, you got all your Mario stuff, your Boos, your Koopa Troopas, and Goombas, and, and such. But then you got all your unique enemies, and unique boss enemies, and the whole smithy thing. All them, they look really good. Like, really interesting. Even though they're pretty, pretty wacky. Like, it, it's very... But they all feel like they come from this game. Like, none of them feel less wacky than others. It's really just... The Mario stuff that you know, and then all this unique stuff, which is all cool, and but all weird and wacky in that same sort of, same sort of way. So basically, the aesthetic is great. Everything looks perfect. The animations are really stylized and expressive, and you know, you know impressively done. They look all good. They're all hilarious when they're used properly, and they always are used properly. It's just 10 out of 10 aesthetic. I can't, I can't possibly have asked for more from a game. Now let's talk about the gameplay. The gameplay of Super Mario uh, RPG is uh, timing based and um, turn based. So basically, since it's an RPG, you've got battles instead of jumping on enemies, but you also jump on enemies. Um, the enemies are running around on the ground, and when they touch you, or you touch them, or whatever, you initiate a battle, and then it's a turn based battle thing with three of your party members, and you got uh, special abilities, you got uh, simple attacks with weapons, and all that good RPG stuff. One thing that was quite interesting is that the the way you do different combat things is determined by four buttons, uh, which would be the four buttons on the Super Nintendo uh, controller. Uh, X, Y, A, and B, and they all do specific things. Uh, on their own, like uh, A, if you press A twice you attack, 
you press A to look at attack and then press A to choose the person you attack and press A again. If you press X, I think you do spell. So you press X to do a spell and then choose the target. You press X to confirm. And if you want to do an item, you press Y and then you press Y again. So it's like you're not using um, the directional buttons and a confirm button. You're just using the button associated with that type of thing. Which is interesting, because I've never seen that really done before. I thought it was really it was really interesting, and it sort of shows how... It's like, it's the, the gameplay is simple, like the combat is simple, you only need four buttons to do everything. But it's simple in a, like, it cuts out the bullshit sort of simple, you know? There's not a million weapons for every person. You know, whenever you go and fight and stuff, you find a weapon, or you buy a weapon from a store for each character, and then you go to the next place, you know, you beat the boss there, and then you go to the next place, and then you can buy a better weapon. And that's all the weapons you get. You just get an upgrade. And it's not just an upgrade in terms of more damage, because the timing thing changes depending on what weapon you're doing. So, for example, if Mario has the hammer, uh, if you press the attack button while he's swinging the hammer at the, you know, at the enemy at the right time, he'll do extra damage. And, um... If you miss, he's more likely to completely miss, or to just do less damage. And if you get a new weapon, it's not only a power increase, but it's also a gameplay changer. You need to uh, adapt to this new way of using the different thing. Like sometimes one of other, Mario's other uh, weapons is a shell, and you throw it, and then you have to time it when you kick it rather than when it hits the enemy. And that's what gives you the extra power. It's like the power up, the, the weapon power ups. Upgrades aren't just, okay, here's power creep, here's just give you more numbers. It's actually a different thing, and it's, it's great. Um, and what else was I saying? I was saying it's about a... I had more to say about that, but I'll probably get to it. Oh, and you can also uh, time defense when you're being attacked in order to prevent damage. So if an enemy hits you and you time it just perfectly, you press a button, I think I usually press A and it works. You press a button and you can do it can do zero damage if you're perfectly on time, or it can do minimal damage if you you're kind of on time. And if you miss, it just does full damage. And that's something that's really cool. It's um, it means that all the battles you have to be constantly focused on what you're doing. You can't just sort of press A and like yeah whatever. I'm playing an RPG. Blah blah blah. I've got a powerful sword. I know I can kill them. Yeah but there but do. You know, you just, you have to be paying attention, you have to press the A button when they attack you to prevent damage, and then you have to press the A button, you have to time the A button for when you're attacking them, to make sure that they die quicker, because otherwise, the game's a lot harder, and, you know, it's also fun and gratifying to get a good, crunchy power attack on somebody, because uh, the, the sound effects also, you know, b beef up when you get it right. And uh, it's just, just really, really appealing, gameplay-wise. Really engaging, really fun. Like, combat, always fun. Never took too long, even some of the bosses that felt like, Oh, will I die? Will it take too long? Will it be a fucking slog? No, none of them are a slog, none of them take too long. Everything feels perfect. It's, it's the perfect video game. It's the perfect RPG. I think as an RPG that I would, like, in terms of... You know RPGs, they take a long time, you know? That's the reason there's a good reason to play a JRPG, because otherwise... Why would I ever play a JRPG? They take too long, but Super Mario RPG... It doesn't waste your time, it... Everything feels... Gratifying and full and... Not shit. So if you were to play any RPG ever... You should play Super Mario RPG, because it won't waste your time and it will be fun all the time... That you're playing it. Another thing about saving time is that the combat encounters, in general, start very quickly. You touch a guy, and the transition is the same every time, I think. It's just like a... You know, one, two seconds, something. Uh, not, not even one second, really. And then you're straight into the battle, and there's no epic cutscene, usually. There might be a few, like, dialogue bits for some bosses, but... You're able to get into the fighting really quick, and just wail away at them. Another thing that's good that doesn't waste your time is the text speed is by default set to fast rather than medium as most games are, so that's cool. The stats in uh, the stats uh, are very simple. 
you've got a, what have you got? You've got HP, attack, defense, magic attack, and magic defense. And that's it. There's no extra superfluous, redundant, annoying to consider bullshit. It's just how much attack you do, how much defense you have, your health, and then the same attack defense for magic. And, you know, it's, it's all you need, really. It's perfectly good. And it makes it makes um, leveling up feel. Oh, that's another thing. Leveling up. Leveling up. Uh, you get a bunch of stats, and then you can choose to specialize in three different ways. You can get an extra bit of H H uh, HP. You can get an extra bit of attack and defense, or you can get an extra bit of magic attack and magic defense. Uh, so depending on what you want your characters to be good at. Um, you can just give them that or what, what they you think they need a bit of help with. So, say for example, I have Bowser on my team. Bowser's a powerhouse, he has a lot of attack and a lot of def defense. So sometimes I would give him more magic attack and magic defense so that he would be defended better against magic attacks. But then also I would s sometimes give him just more attack and more defense to make him even beefier, even more powerful. So like if you want to specialize in one or the other, you know, you you can do that, it's quite easy. And it's quite easy to, to, con to comprehend is the main thing. Like, if you've got s uh, three or five or six party characters, and they've each got like 17 different stats, and when you level up you can put numbers into certain stats, I'm like, it's too much, too many numbers, like I'm not a math magician, I, j I can't do that. I don't care, I just want to play video games, and Super Mario RPG is the perfect one for that sort of gameplay player game. Timing the defense is quite difficult sometimes though, uh, because, especially against magic attacks, I don't know whether you can even defend against magic attacks, because the way they do them, like when something comes up to you and does a melee attack, it's like a stab, like, Hur! you know, and you and you get them on the, Hur! you press A there, and then it's ting, and it's zero damage. So they do a melee attack, and then the magic attacks is different, because uh, they don't do a single moment. You know, I never know when to press the defense button against a magic attack or even if that works because it could be like a blast and it could go like, at what point was I supposed to press defend? Has it ended? Just as it ended? Or as it was fading out? Or as it was at its highest? Or when it was being cast? I could never figure it out. So I always kept taking damage from magic attacks which was a piece of shit but I guess it shouldn't be easy to defend against literally every attack, otherwise you'd never get hit. So, fair enough. Uh, but I would have liked a bit more confirmation on whether I was doing it right or wrong. Like, that was the only thing that I, I had a problem with, was I was never sure how to do something correctly like that, how to time it correctly, and I didn't know whether I was close or not. I just, you know... Maybe if there was like a tutorial where a guy showed me exactly what you can defend against. Because I think they just briefly mentioned you can press the button to time your defense. And from there you've got to figure it out for every different type of attack from every enemy. But you know, it's still a cool, cool thing. Now, there's other things other than platform, uh, other than combat in this game. It's platforming. There's platforming in this game. And it's not great. Some parts are alright, but most of the time, the isometrics perspective makes uh, combat, uh, platforming I mean, makes platforming difficult and really hard to wrap your head around what you're doing wrong. Uh, in theory, it shouldn't be too hard because you only have eight directions really. You have left, right, up, down, and then up, left, you know, in between. But Determining where something is, whether it's above you or next to you, sometimes is kind of hard, especially where there's this platforming challenges. And uh, I was never really good at these platforming challenges, and there's certain areas where it's not really a challenge to platform, it's just like, it's platforming and, ju and there it is, you just gotta have to do it. Like there's this bit with the beanstalks, what you do, you jump on them, and then you gr and then he grabs, Mario grabs hold, and then you press up and down to go up and down, and then you press jump to jump off. And once you get to the top, you're you're on top of the beanstalk, and then you've got to jump to another one. But very often, I'll jump, you know, too far to the left or the right of the next one, and it will just uh, just fall down again. 
Platforming sucks. It's not very good. It's just, it's just, um, it's, it doesn't really work in that isometric perspective. It's, um, it's a shame because the jumping's great. You know, if if the jumping sound wasn't as great as it was, I would get more annoyed. But really, it's, it's yeah. something I love about the battle system is the way that it handles status effects and death. If a character dies at the end of the battle. They just are alive again. You don't have to use a revival item except when it's in a battle, when it's most important that you have somebody come back to life. Um, so that's really handy. It means that you're not wasting items reviving people outside of battle, and you can just use a heal spell instead or something. Um, so that's really cool. Like I really like that. That people, you know, they just come back to life. Also, status effects, things like poison and sleep and being turned into a scarecrow or a mushroom. They go away, they just stop existing after you win. So the battles are all about fighting them in the moment with what you have, and then afterwards it sort of resets, it lets you, you know, you can pause the game, you can heal up, but you gotta, you don't need to use any status items, and which is great. Uh, especially since the item uh, storage space, your inventory is quite small. You know, you might need a lot of a certain item, but you also have all these other ones that are also useful and you don't know what to keep. Maybe there was a bag that I could have got, like it would increase my inventory space. I didn't find it, if so. Oh, uh, the inv incivili invisibility, in invincibility star. Uh, that one. Uh, once you get that, you can just walk into enemies, and instead of having to battle them, they just die, and you get all the experience from them, which is really cool. Especially in a few areas where it's designed, there's a there's hundred of enemies and you can just get the star and go fucking to town. You can go to town on them. Nice nice implementation of, of Mario powers, power-ups. Uh, I don't know whether there's mu I mean, there are mushrooms. Mushrooms are health. So you use a mushroom, you get health back. But the star especially is really cool. When you kill a, when you kill a bunch of enemies, you know, you, you, you have a battle, they're gone, and that's it. They're actually gone. They don't respawn, even if you leave the area and come back. They don't respawn even if you leave two areas and then come back. Because the thing is designed so that you can defeat them. And then, I mean, some areas where they do respawn forever. But those are deliberate, which is, is cool. Because like if you need to grind, if you need extra experience, if there's a tough boss ahead, there's usually an area where you can just grind over and over again to get the experience you need so you can fight them without having to run really far away and grind somewhere else. They do respawn enemies, but not while you're in the same place. Like, if you're in a dungeon, they don't respawn from, you know, if you're still in the dungeon, unless it's a constantly respawning area. It's just good. It's good that, that it's like that, because the combat can, the platforming, I mean, can be kind of tricky, and if you've got a bunch of enemies that are around that are hindering your platforming by, you know, you're trying to jump around things and then, oh, you touch them and you've got to fight. Uh, if you get too annoyed with dealing with both of them at the same time, you can just go through, kill everything, and then do the platforming, and it's, it's great. Now, there's other things other than platforming and combat. Uh, these little wacky side things, like, so they're unique, and you can do them again for frog coins, which are coins you use to buy very, very cool items later on. But the first one I wrote down was uh, you go into these Kero sewers and you beat a boss and then to leave the sewers you go down this you know, waterfall and while you're on the waterfall you can collect coins and move left and right and stuff and it's like a whole, whole big thing. You can go in different caves, uh, try and get coins, try and get stuff. I don't know what else there was there. There's just, you know, it's cool, you're going down the waterfall, then you're on the river, and then you're on barrels, and you've got to jump from barrel to barrel, collecting coins, and uh, it's just, there was no reason for any of that to, to be there, other than for it to be cool, interesting, fun uh, gameplay moment, and uh, there's multiple ones of those throughout the game, it's, it's good. Good, good variety of shit to do when you're bored of fighting. But yeah, one of the other uh, interesting little things is a minecart moving thing in the molehill mountain. It's pretty cool, but I couldn't get the hang of it, and I kept falling over at the, the complete U-turns. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand the minecart thing. How it works. There's a lot of places where I'm not sure how you're supposed to do things. A few extra tutorials here and there would have been helpful because for stuff like that, you need to know what the controls are. And if they don't really tell you, you're gonna have to look it up. And I don't want to do that. One thing about the the fact that there is jumping and you have to touch the enemies to initiate battle is that it, you can just jump past them if you're good enough and you really need to get to a save point or to a town or something you're like oh shit I can't be bothered to fight all this shit I'll jump over them and if you're good at jumping and you're good at timing your jumps you can that's how all the enemies are laid out they have little paths and usually there's a gap in between them sometimes it's kinda hard to to get in that gap but when you do you can be rewarded by not having to fight anything. You know, another gameplay design decision that I really like. There was this one boss character, I can't remember his name, he, he was like a, a bow and arrow guy, uh, but he had this special gameplay mechanic that I really liked where he would just prevent the use of a certain button. So there's the attack button, the magic button, and the item button. And he would just turn one of them, turn one of them off, so you couldn't attack, or you couldn't use magic, or you couldn't use items, which was you know, really cool, really good for strategy, it makes you think. Now one thing I don't like about the way the item, I mean this is kind of difficult to implement for such a small amount of screen space, but, you know, and the, the resolution of the, the pixels, but you can't see a description of the items while you're in battle, and you can't go to a menu to look at the descriptions. Uh, sometimes some of the items I'm not sure what they do and I can't go into a menu to check what they do because all the buttons are mapped to a different action. Sometimes I'm just stuck not being able to use an item because it could be exactly what I need but I don't know what it does and I don't want to waste it so I just don't use it and uh, it's annoying. The way the game is paced uh, feels very fast and it feels very progression-y like you're, you're very soon into the game I had already gotten two of the seven stars that I'm looking for and you know you get the third one quite quick you get the fourth one very easily you get the fifth one quite you know quick after that it's like it feels like it I mean the sixth one is like really hard to get and then the seventh one is incredibly hard to get which is like a ramp up of, of difficulty which is really nice like I, I like the fact that you get stars quite quick early on to give you a feeling of like, yeah, let's keep going. There's, it's not, it's not a slog yet. It's not, it's not taking a lot out of you to get to this point. You know, halfway, you're like, shit, this game's barely begun, and I'm already four stars in. You know, it, it sort of encourages you to keep going because it feels easy, but of course it gets harder and harder as it goes. And it's just, if by the very end, it feels incredibly epic. One thing I like that I wrote here is, this game is polished beyond human understanding. It's, it's really true, everything about this game is polished to a T. The T is shining, the sun is delicious, and uh, the game is great. It's Nothing feels rushed, nothing feels like they didn't have enough time to finish it. It's like a perfect, complete experience. You could not possibly update it with DLC. A cool thing about uh, battling is that uh, you have a mul well, you have multiple party members that you can switch out. So you have five. Uh, Mario always has to be there. You get Mallow, Bowser, Geno, Gino, uh, and Peach, Princess Toad's duel. And you can only have three of, it, uh, three of them at a time in a battle, so you have to switch them out. But the cool thing is, when you get experience, the experience is equal among all your guys. So there's no such thing as like having to swap people out to level them up individually. You just, you know, your level is determined by the experience you get. It doesn't matter who's fighting, they'll get leveled up too. So if you want to swatch, switch them out at any point, it's easy. There's nothing wrong with it, there's nothing difficult, nothing, you know, the game doesn't get harder. It's just the same, you can just switch them out. The only thing is, though, I never felt like switching out my characters. Like, for the, for the majority of the game, I played with Mario, Mallow, and then Bowser, when I got Bowser. Because Mallow has healing powers, which uh, I really liked. 
and thought that you know they're very useful to have a guy healing your other guys instead of having to use items all the time. And Bowser was like a powerhouse, he was really strong, really tough, could hit enemies really hard, so I liked those two, and then you had to have Mario, so I kept those three for the basically the whole game. And I never really used Geno or Princess Toadstool. I didn't use Princess Toadstool at all. I mean, you know, tell me off if you want, but there's there's not really much of an incentive to switch them out, even though they are the same level, you know, with, because of the experience thing. It's just, you have to decide to do it, and there's not really any reason to if you have a good party la um, layout. My party was basically perfect, like, those three could defeat anything, and they did. I beat the whole game with them, and if I wanted to switch them out, I would have to relearn how to do attacks with all their different abilities, and it just feels like it's more hassle than it's worth. I mean, I know some people will be like, how could you fucking not use Geno? He's the coolest. For me, for GRPJ, I play the game however I feel like playing it at the time. And that will be my experience of the game, which uh, will be this video, is my experience of the game. If I ever want to go back and play Geno with Geno and Princess Toadstool, I can, and I probably will, um, because, you know, I love the game so much that I actually do want to go back and play it, unlike Final Fantasy VII, which was great, but it's so much extra stuff and so much grinding that I would have to do to get all my characters up to, to fight all those, uh, those extra bosses, and like, no. Like, no, I'm not, I don't have that time. The, the reason it's a GRPG is a good reason to play JRPG, because I get a video out of it, and a video is entertainment for people, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll go back and play as Geno and Princess Toadstool in my own time. There's lots of puzzles in the game, uh, areas where you have to think about stuff rather than jump or attack. One area where you're in the ship, you got to think of uh, whether it's you know, you've got to think of the password using clues. You know, stuff like that can be fun. I did enjoy that particular one because uh, I figured it out. But some of them are a bit annoying. Uh, the one I'm thinking of in particular was the one that is optional, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, it's the one in Bowser's Castle where you have to figure out between three of these guys which one of them came first in the triathlon. Uh, depending, uh, according to what they tell you. And I wrote it down, and I've studied it for ages, and I could not figure out what the hell the solution was. I had no idea, and I guessed, and I got it right anyway, so I guess I'll never know what the fuck that was about. There's just, uh, puzzles can be good, but sometimes fuck them. There's not that many difficult puzzles in the game, really. There's like two that are required that I can think of. There's a boss battle with uh, Johnny, the shark pirate cool guy, and I wasn't prepared for this, and it made me die. But uh, basically Mario and Johnny fight one-on-one, -on -one, which was really difficult for me because I was not used to fighting without healing, so it was a much harder fight and I actually had to grind a bit for that one, but luckily um, there was a bunch of dry bones in the room before the save point, so I could just go back and grind up a few levels very quickly with those guys. So yeah, it was annoying to have to suddenly adapt to a new, you know, one-on-one -on -one sort of combat thing, but ultimately I think it's pretty cool, because Johnny is a cool guy and the fact that you fought him one-on-one -on -one and he becomes your friend cool. Uh, there's an uh, another boss right afterwards, and he was way too far. It was like Yaridovich or something. Way too hard. So I had to grind a bit more, and uh, I learned from doing that that the way you're supposed to play is you're supposed to just try and kill everything that comes in your path. If you dodge past all the enemies in the hallways, you're going to be underleveled by the time you get to the boss. And so from that point on, I killed every enemy I found. I never had to, to grind again. It was, uh, it was pretty great. Pretty good progression design, sort of pacing, or whatever you call it. I don't know terminology. What am I, a guy? Now, when you go to Monstro Town, there's a bunch of guys in there that tell you about certain stats that you have. One guy tells you exactly how many hidden chests you haven't found in the world, like the whole game, which is really cool. And then there's another guy who tells you um, the three musty fears. 
they tell you that there's like special secret things in certain places and they give you hints and you've got to go find them. And uh, these things in Monstro Town, it really gives you an incentive to go back and explore the world after you're done or, you know, in, in at some point to find all this cool hidden shit. And I probably will because the game's fun. So yeah, it's, it's nice that there's replayability value. And the fact that they tell you that is also very nice because you don't have to wonder or just look up online what what I miss, you know, because that always sucks when you're typing in secrets in fucking game and you find out all this stuff and you're like, oh, well, there's no way I would have ever found that. Too bad, you know, at least in this game they tell you that there's stuff to find and you can go find it if you're an explorer. The thing that I noticed was even when I wasn't feeling that great about the game, like something was annoying me, Every bad moment is only just a moment. It's not really a long thing. It doesn't take very long. It doesn't last. I don't feel angry for a very long time. It's... The, the bad moments are fleeting. And that's good, because... The worst thing you can do is get so far in an RPG and then find out that you just kind of hate it on a fundamental level, and it's like, well, I've got to finish it, I guess. I got this far. But no, the fundamentals are great, and there's just a few little bits here and there that are, that are sometimes annoying, but not for very long, so... Even the bad bits are pretty great. Everything's pretty great. I have bad vocabulary. What about it? You wanna come fight me? There's this really cool bit where uh, you're, you're being a statue in a, in a castle to, you know, to avoid detection, and then there's this bird guy who comes and he pecks the statues because he's angry, and you gotta jump at the exact right moment so that he pecks underneath you and then he goes on and he's like, wait a minute, what the hell? Did that statue move? And he goes back and he tries it again and you jump and it's like, huh, you know, you, you're spooking him. It's, it's really cool, it's just like having these extra little bits that would be like in time intensive to implement all these different unique scenarios. But they went and did them anyway because they're just that great a game guy makers. Okay, there was this one puzzle where it was a quiz, and I hated it, because, uh, you know, the quiz is quite difficult. And I don't mind quizzes, because, you know, they can be kind of interesting, like, how, how well were you paying attention uh, during the whole game? It's like, whoa, I don't know, how well, how well was I paying attention? Do I know these things? Am I smart? Am I observant? But when it comes to this, it's, there's no stakes. There's no real thing for failure, like, it's not about getting the questions right, so much as it is getting the questions wrong enough times that you can get them right because there's only so many questions. It's trial and error. It's it's a trial and error thing, because there's no penalty for losing. You go back and try again until you win. A quiz like that should be for something like a, a special item, like, you only get one chance at it, or two chances to get the quiz right, and if you don't get get it right then you lose and you don't you don't get the cool item and it's like ah oh, fuck I fucking sh shit I don't know what I'm saying I just think the quiz was stupid not because it was hard but because the difficulty didn't matter because I could just do it over and over again with no penalty anything left I've got to talk about is uh, Smithy uh, the last boss uh, Smithy was quite tough but I managed to beat him on my first try through a lot of a lot of items that I had, a lot of pick-me-ups, uh, which were the, the revive items. Yeah, it's it's one of those those endurance matches. You gotta, I mean, as final bosses go, it was definitely the toughest boss. Definitely a very interesting boss. Used a lot of interesting attacks, especially in his second form, and uh, it was cool. Like the, the the battle was good. It wasn't a piece of shit. It wasn't too hard. It wasn't too easy. I died a lot, but I had enough pick-me-ups to continue being alive. But yeah, Smithy was a good final boss. I had to use all my offensive items, I had to use all my pick-me-ups, pick I had to use a lot of uh, magic. I was, Mallow was healing every single round, always healing, always keeping people up. You know, occasionally it would be... It's, it's like an endurance match, especially the first form, because you, there's, there's the guy making the little guys, and they're quite dangerous actually. You have to kill the little guys really quick. 
But then if you kill a little guy at the wrong time, the thing will just make another little guy straight away, and the little guy is really fast, and he does another attack straight away. So I tried to destroy the, the thing that was making the little guys, and that had quite a lot of health too, so I was always like... I was healing with Mallow, and then sometimes I had to heal with Mario, and then Bowser would attack one, one thing. And then they made a little guy, and so Mario and Bowser had to attack the little guy, and I would heal up whoever needed healing with Mallow, and then Mario would use an item to heal Bowser, and Mallow would heal Mario, or himself, and Bowser would hit the, the thing making the little guys, it was just every ever so slightly getting closer to defeating him. And it was really long, and really tense, because, you know, there's always that chance that you could completely block damage from the attack, um, if you press the button timing right. And some attacks, I think you just can't time it correctly. No matter how well you time it, you can't get it down to zero. But really tense fight, really long fight, really engaging fight, and really cool second form when he go he goes falls down the crack and he gets an ugly head and his head changes the size and shape. And what, what the hell was all those other heads down there? Like they looked like his head. There was a huge one. Were they like other ones of him, or is that his race? Did he kill them all? Are they made of metal? Were they invented by each other? I don't know. It's crazy. I don't think anyone knows. Oh, and uh, at the end, literally the end card, you can't press start and save your game or go back to the menu, as far as I could see. You just had to turn off the system, or in my case the emulator. Uh, which means that you can't beat Smithy and then go do anything. You have to do everything, secret stuff or whatever. Get the frog coins, do the mini games, do all that shit, and then you can fight and kill Smithy. I don't mind that too much. I just find that it's more convenient and nice when you can just go back and do whatever. I understand that it wouldn't make sense because everybody at the end is like off on their own. Bowser's in his castle, you know, Mallow's in the Nimbus place. All right, and that's that's gameplay. That's the whole gameplay section done, done and dusted. Oh, how dusted it is! And now we're gonna go moving on to the next one. The story is uh, Mario is playing a game called Super Mario RPG, and he walks around and he does things. I forget what happens. All right, I, re I really didn't write down much of the story and the characters. I'm stupid. I'm sorry, Mom. You'll have to play the game for yourself to find out the story intricacies. The story is very simple, but it's effective, and it's effective because the characters in the story are very likable. Very fun, very cool, very well realized, and that's all down to the animations and the writing of the dialogue. Mario goes to save Princess Toadstool, and then when he gets her, he finds out what he, what he finds Geno. Geno says that the seven st magical star pieces of the Star Road that Grant wishes to everyone, it's been broken, and we've got to find the pieces, and now we've got two things to do. We've got to find the star pieces, we've got to save the princess. Now the princess is back once you save the princess, and then you got to just... This princess wants to save the world too, so you take her, you take everyone, and Bowser's there as well. And there's this kid Mallow who fell from the sky, and you're all going to go save the, the Star Road by getting all the pieces, and Smithy, the guy who invaded the world, has the last piece. That's the basic story. Now, the uh, characters uh, are pretty good. I'll start by just saying Mario, despite not having any dialogue, and generally in, you know, historically being a completely bland video game character with no personality at all, is actually really cool in this. He actually, you know, he has uh, moments of anger and frustration, and, you know, moments of, you know, he plays with the little kid, with the toys, you know, he's he's playful, he's fun, he's he's a celebrity, but he doesn't brag about it. You know, people know Mario, they know him from his exploits in the Mushroom Kingdom, which is pretty cool detail, by the way. I, f I like the fact that people recognize Mario as the Mario, jumping Mario. Holy shit, he's a ma he's a famous guy. He's lovable. He does all these little animations, little mimes, little uh, performances when he's trying to explain something to someone else uh, because he doesn't talk and he's just generally a really nice character. I really like Mario, which is, you know, something I thought I'd never say. <laughs> uh, then we got Mallow, which is a little puffball guy who thinks he's a tadpole at first because he fell from the sky and a frog guy took him under his leg. But yeah, Mallow is the print. he's a cloud prince, and he just wants to find his parents or get back home or something. It's pretty funny, uh, he's like a kid, he's naive, and he's adorable, and he, and he's, and when he's like really happy, that happy face he makes, really makes me happy. 
You know, he's, he's the cutest little guy ever. And when he learns that he's not actually a frog, it's like, Oh my god! I never knew! Like, it's, it's nice. Mallow's cute, Mallow's great, and he's, you know, this is the righteous good guy boy. Then we got Geno. Geno, Gino, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm sure there's, like, uh, arguments about that. But Gino is... A cool character. He is a toy that got turned into a real life boy. He's a Pinocchio. And um, he's got a fucking Astro Boy uh, charged laser arm, which is amazing. And he's, he's generally like the coolest guy. He's, he's one of those, huh, whatever, huh. You know, constantly got angry eyes. But he's, he's not like um, an asshole sort of cool guy character. He can be nice and friendly when he wants to be. He's very loyal and dependable and a cool guy. Unfortunately, I didn't play much of him in terms of combat, and I don't know whether that would have affected how much I get to see his interactions with things. Because there is sometimes when you've got your, pa your party around, the people in your immediate party will come out and, you know, they'll have something to say to a character or they'll be around for something. And I don't know whether... The people in your party, like if you switch them rounds, there'll be different interactions. It's kind of similar to Final Fantasy now that I think about it, Final Fantasy 7. Where like, different f well actually, was it Final Fantasy 7 that even did, did that? Where depending on who you had in your immediate party, different things could happen, different dialogue could happen. I don't know, but regardless, I didn't have Geno in my party all the time, really at all, uh, until, you know, after I got Bowser. So I don't know much about what he was like beyond cutscenes. But he did seem like a cool guy and I liked him. Uh, then there's Princess, or oh, there's Bowser then. Bowser is my favourite character in this game. He is uh, completely hilarious and tsundere. Tsundere? Oh fuck. Alright, that was a car alarm. That was the tsundere car alarm. Duh, don't drive this car. Babaka. There's also a plane going overhead. Whatever, audio sucks. Get over it, son. You, you'll be audio one day. Anyway, Bowser is my favorite because he's like, he's really, like, I, I'm supposed to be really tough and gruff and stuff, but he's actually really sweet and, you know, self-conscious and likes keeping his image up. And there's various moments uh, where you find, like, a, like Bowser, Bowser's castle's been attacked, so all of his Koopa Troopers and his minions are all over the place. Some of them joined uh, Smithy because they had to. And some of them are just around. Uh, when you go to Monstro Town, there's a there's a Goomba in there that Bowser recognizes, and the Goomba has got married and had kids, and he's got little baby Goombas in his shop, and he's like, "Oh, sorry, Bowser, for for abandoning you. I just I just found this, you know, I settled down, and you know, it's like." And Bowser's like, "Don't worry about it. Uh, have have a good life, you know. You're 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 my soldier." And he's like, he's, he really genuinely cares for his troops, which is really sweet and he's like he's like um he's like a a dad that doesn't realize he's not a cool teenager anymore you know he doesn't realize that he's actually become a softy and that he's a really nice guy he still thinks he's a badass but he's not he's just he's just the cutest guy ever bowser's great princess toadstool i don't think i mean she obviously has character she's like mischievous and she breaks the rules but since I didn't have her in my party, I don't know whether I missed out interactions with her in the same way that I missed interactions with Gino, so I don't know much about what she was like, really. She was just sort of there. We saved her. That's about all I know. Oh, and uh, Johnny. I didn't talk about Johnny, really. Johnny the Pirate Shark was really cool because not only did you have to fight him one-on-one -on -one and beat him, and then he gives you the star piece out of respect rather than you killing him. Later, when you fight Yaridovich, and you, you, the star gets taken from you. He arrives and forces, uh, stops the enemy from escaping with the star piece. And then, you know, he's like, he's a, he's, he calls Mario his mate. It's like, you mean mate Mario? It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool pirate code of honor sort of thing. That Mario beat him, and therefore he's a cool guy and, you know, he treats him with respect. Yeah, there should be a whole game about Johnny the, the pirate shark. So, uh, Smithy was quite... A uh, mystery for most of the game. Nobody really knew anything about Smithy, and Smithy's minions would never say anything particularly, like, uh, descriptive about him. Just that he was their boss, and he was in charge, and he was going to take over the world or whatever. 
So I'm like, who the hell, what the hell is Smithy? What, I mean, I, I deduced due to his name and the fact that all the enemies were metal and the fact that he had a giant sword that he threw onto Bowser's castle that he was a blacksmith of some kind and he just made stuff. But I was like, why? What, why is he doing this? What, what is he doing? Why is he doing it? And I got to the end and it turns out he just does make, he just likes making weapons. And he is kind of made of a weapon himself. I don't know what he is, but I kind of like how simply, like, simple and... Like, I like the fact that he's just a villain. He's just an asshole. He wanted to take over the world with his weapons, so he tried to, and Mario stopped him. Nowadays, you would expect a villain to have sympathy points, or some tragic backstory that would explain why they are the way they are, but Smithy is just a weird, ugly, robot, metal, m machine blacksmith who wants to kill everybody with weapons, and that's it. I kind of like that, actually. Also, there is quite a bit of a mystery. Uh, when you're fighting Smithy, there's the, the like the field of dead Smithy heads. I don't know why they're there. Nobody mentions them, nobody talks about them. When you beat Smithy after that fight, you don't go back there. That's, the game's over. You can't think about it, you can't talk about it to anybody. You're just, you're just, a hu there's a huge Smithy head in the background. And you're standing on a bunch of smithy heads and smithy's there and i'm like is he one of them or did he create them or did he create himself or what did he come to life due to the star piece or did he break the star road i forget i forget but yeah it's like the fuck is he who cares we killed him so yeah smithy was cool as a villain it was refreshingly non complicated. It's it's a good cast of characters, obviously there's other characters, there's all the, the townsfolk, uh, there's Croco, who's a, who's a fucking asshole, uh, stealing shit. I don't know whether I mentioned this already, but when you're in Bowser's castle, you know, coming finally back to Bowser's castle, if Bowser is in your party, the minions of Bowser, like the Koopa Troopers, the Goombas and stuff, they will run away. I think I did say that earlier, but it's it's cool that the character is like universal. There's every character, everything has character, even like monsters sometimes, where there's like what they do is less primal and more human than you would expect from an RPG anyway. So really good, really good character design development overall. It's Top notch, everything about this game is 10 out of 10. Now I suppose I should talk about the end of the game. Uh, Gino, when you get all the star pieces, he stops being a toy. If he just he dies, kind of, but he, his star soul goes up and he fixes the star road and everything's great again with the miracles. And uh, it's pretty sad. I, I, I have a feeling like if I was a little kid and I'd been playing this game for weeks and months because it's quite hard uh, if, you, you know, if you're not the best at it, like me. Like an adult with the time and patience to play the game really well all the way through. Like, I feel like if you were a kid, you would have spent more time playing the game, and therefore would have felt more of a connection to Geno, and been a lot more sad when he died. Especially if you didn't see it coming. I saw it coming because of the fact that he came to life as a doll. So it was like, of course, when, once his mission is over, he's gonna go back. But that was pretty sad. The look on Mario's face as well was like, Oh! Oh no! But then he turned into a little twinkly star and everyone was like, yeah, he's okay, he's just a little twinkly star. So it was nice. Mallow got his little crown and cape, being a prince. Bowser got his troops back repairing and it's all... Yeah, that's, that's about the extent of the characters and story. So I guess I'll just wrap up my thoughts. If you're looking for an RPG that doesn't take a fucking decade to complete and is fun and never grindy throughout the whole thing if you know what you're doing. Play this game, definitely. If you're if you're on a budget for time, play Super Mario RPG. You will not regret it because it is legitimately one of my favorites so I played. Better than Kingdom Hearts. I would I would stretch to say it's better than Final Fantasy VII. It's a different kind of RPG. It's Final Fantasy VII is a whoa, it's huge massive scope and a bit more serious and uh, epic, and I mean epic in the terms of like actually epic, like big, big old story. Um, Super Mario RPG is a cozier adventure story, and it's a lot, you know, still fun to play, but in, in a different way. So, uh, those are that's my thoughts on Super Mario RPG. Um, I have a link to my full notes in the description if you would like to read uh, some of the things I didn't touch on. 
and uh, yeah, the next RPG I'll be doing will be a non-huge RPG. It'll be a, a small indie game uh, that I promised a friend I would do a GRPG on. So yeah, have fun and goodbye. Thank you.